I do want to make uh, at least amends to the uh, some some really great new friends at the uh, the Fisherman's Wharf Association is sponsoring uh, our closer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Astro said uh, he he likes being on one one of the clo the the ends of beginning or end of this thing. I call them bookends, and here's our closer. She's uh, she's really up there. She's uh, been the former director of the study for, uh, Center for Scientific Studies at San Jose State University for 18 years, I believe. Uh, and now, uh, she's still teaching at San Jose State. She assumed last year, she assumed the onus of um, shepherding the National Steinbeck Center through its uh, very treacherous path to becoming uh, an associate. You, you can explain the relationship. <laughs> but. <laughs> She, she, she saved the. As far as those of us on the street, she saved the center. Is what she did. She, she volunteered to take the helm at the most dangerous part of the transition, where it could have gone under, or it could become affiliated in some nefarious uh, manner with uh, uh, CSUMB. But we're glad it happened because uh, it, it's giving her a chance to really turn the lights on over there. Uh, I still owe you a, a, a constant contact that's going to go out the minute I get some sleep. Okay. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Su Susan Schillinglaw. Uh, those of you who know anything about Steinbeck and Ricketts know her already, so with fewer words, take it, my dear. I feel I have to say something about CSUMB. <laughs> um, so CSUMB owns the building, the National Steinbeck Center in Salinas, and the Steinbeck Center is a separate 501c3, and we're still vigorously um, sailing along, um, having crossed the shoals, uh, and so that's where we are. So I was just there today for a wonderful um, Steinbeck Young Authors um, program, and this is the journal. So I hope, as a bridge from what John Gregg said to what I'm going to say, I hope that the um, Western Flyer program can ha encourage students to write and write about science and write about literature and bring a lot of families and students together, because that's what happened today. And there were over 250 people there. So it was really a great event. Um, so anyway, um, I today I'm going to talk about Steinbeck and Ricketts and their relationship. I often start, when I teach Of Mice and Men, I ask my students, does Lenny need George more, or does George need Lenny more? And the origin of this talk is, did Steinbeck need Ricketts more, or did Ricketts need Steinbeck more? Um, and that's a question that I want to entertain. So that's why it's about mutualism um, and the power of narrative. It's got a better title in your program, um, because that's what Steinbeck said about Ricketts. Um, he aches me like a missing arm. Uh, but uh, so I want to talk about uh, who they were, why they were together, and what that relationship meant. So the first part's kind of a summary of all that you've heard. So nothing new here. It's just kind of a summary of Ricketts and why he was celebrated um, in the way that he was and why he um, has a kind of my favorite explanation of who Ricketts is was those old, um, when we, had, we were covering up where the Clement now is on Cannery Row, there were all sorts of murals. And one of them had the head of Ricketts sort of hovering over Monterey like a god. And that's how I think of him, that he still kind of hovers over us like a god. Um, so his mind had no horizons. That's what fascinated Steinbeck. But what exactly does that mean? He moved here, as all of you know, from Chicago. Probably we wanted to get away from the winters. Um, in 1923, with his wife Anna and his partner Gallagher, they established a biological laboratory. Um, I'm sure that you've heard a lot about that today. Um, and he had a lot of contact with Hopkins marine scientists um, because Hopkins was established right here in 1892, a year after the university opened. Um, because the president um, wanted there to, David Starr Jordan wanted there to be a marine station just like the one in Italy, Dorans in Italy. So he wanted one for his own new university. So that's why. It's here. Um, W.K. Fisher, who ran the center for a long time, wrote this in 1919, trying to describe exactly what the marine station was up to. But it's a, it's a statement of ecological sort of um, 
uh, responsibility, the same sort of thing that Ricketts was interested in when he came four years later. It's, when the, it's, when the, it's within the scope of a marine station to find out everything possible about the animals and plants of the ocean, as well as about the physical characteristics of the ocean itself. It's concerned, that is Hopkins, is concerned with the life history of animals and plants, whence they come, their behavior and interrelationships, what they eat, what eats them, where they live, what controls their diurnal and seasonal wandering, when they spawn, and so on. I just put this slide in to show what kind of interesting interactions there would have been between Hopkins scientists and Ricketts once he arrived. By the way, this picture was um, created by Fisher. Um, he was quite an artist. Um, and he illustrated his wife's book, Anne Fisher. One of the books is The Upside Down River, about the Salinas River. So he did these lovely line drawings. And actually, there are a lot of paintings that he did there in the Hopkins Library. Um, so invertebrates um, were Ricketts' first love. Um, he called them his little beasties. Um, and he went and collected them as soon as he got here. So he was first and foremost a collector. And this is his 1925 catalog. That's where that wonderful octopus comes from. I just put that on a t-shirt at the National Steinbeck Center. Um, there's only one of these I know of in existence, and it's at San Jose State. Uh, so I don't know why there are no others. Probably he didn't print that many, but I'd love to know where another one is. But that's the only one. But you see Ricketts stretching there to get a sea star. Um, Ricketts was also a cataloger. Um, and he had a mind that cataloged everything. Um, John Gregg talked about the great charts on his wall, so he was cataloging art and music. Um, he cataloged poetry. Of course, he cataloged invertebrates from various regions. He cataloged his friends, for heaven's sakes. He broke them down into categories, sort of Jungian categories, and sort of talked about those who were more emotional and those who were more rational. And so he just, it seems like he had to put everything in categories. Um, so these are the files that were at Hopkins. They were found when Hopkins um, worked on uh, Agassiz. And so they went and are now in the ground floor of the lab. They went there. And there were cards in them uh, when they were found. So um, those are at the library now. But Ricketts was also a writer. Um, he wrote a lot. He wrote private journals. He wrote public journals. He wrote essays on cataloging poetry, as I said, pers um, personalities, and methods of ecology. So he wrote all the time. I don't know when the man slept. Um, because he seems to have stayed up late, uh, so, and um, he just had this prodigious energy, it seems to me. Uh, he was also a thinker. Um, that was one of the things, obviously, that attracted Steinbeck to him. Um, here's one of his comments, one that I love. Dr. Walter K. Fisher at Hopkins said one day that you could find any scientific discovery in the poetry of the preceding generation. The artist is simply the spokesman of the phalanx. When a man hears great music, sees great pictures, reads great poetry, he loses his identity in that of the phalanx. I do not need to describe the emotion caused by these things, but it's invariably a feeling of oneness with one's phalanx. Now, Steinbeck picked up that idea and wrote all of his treatment of group, um, humans in groups and in dubious battle and the grapes of wrath um, are taken from this whole idea of the phalanx. And Steinbeck also saw himself as the sort of artist to sort of interpreta interpreting um, history, social history issues, because the artist is the one who expresses things at the sort of culmination or head of the phalanx. So clearly, you know, the ideas that Ricketts um, and Steinbeck discussed were many and varied. Of course, Ricketts was also a co an ecologist. I'm cataloging Ricketts myself. I'm giving you, I'm sort of cataloging his traits. So I thought I would be inspired by the man and catalog his traits. Um, and you know this, uh, this is what we've been talking about all day. Here's what he said in his 1925 catalog, and I love this. A high percentage of the materials listed herein are kept constantly at hand. It should be borne in mind, and this applies especially to the local marine forms, that we must Above all else, avoid depleting the region by over-collecting. So he said that in 1925. So he's very much aware of what he's up to. 
Um, a lot of the people complained that the Chinese were overcollecting, so to some extent it was a response to that, that he wasn't overcollecting. Um, more formally rich regions, according to reliable authorities, already afford instances of the ease with which depletion is brought about. Monterey Bay is probably richer in individuals and species than any other region of like size in the United States. And it would be unfortunate if such a situation were to arise here. It was that wealth, um, it was that richness that brought him here in the first place. And of course he had a focus on communities in everything he did. That was Ricketts' great passion, was the little beasties seen in their communities. Um, as he says again in 1936, before he ever got Between Pacific Tides published, interrelation is the keynote of modern holistic concepts wherein the whole consists of the animal and the community, its environment, the notion of relation being significant. Um, and of course, that's one of the best expressions, I think, of his holistic um, thought. All come culminating in this book you've heard a lot about, I'm sure, Between Pacific Tides, um, which is organized by community. The frontispiece, however, defies the very organization of the book. It's pretty, but it's all chitons. And it's not organized by community, but so be it. It's a nice picture, so just forget about the fact that it sort of contradicts the very organization of the book. Um, and finally, of course, he was a scientist. Um, and the range of his science, I think, is what's so interesting. Um, those who want to dismiss him, of course, he didn't have a degree, and he didn't graduate from the University of Chicago, and I didn't have a PhD, etc. But he studied a lot of different things when he was here. Um, vitamin A and shark liver oil. My husband keeps wanting me to take that one out because it makes him sound like a sh you, sh you know snake oil salesman. But I'm really fascinated with the shark liver oil, so I keep I keep it in because he sold he gave vials of shark's liver oil to all sorts of people. One of whom was um, Charles Erskine Scott Wood, who lives in Los Gatos, the cats. And Wood ended up in the hospital. Um, after taking the shark's liver oil and wrote this very nice letter saying, I don't blame being in the hospital on the shark's liver oil. You know, you're not at fault. Um, and Ricketts said, no, it wasn't the shark's liver oil. And he sent it to Co Pascal Kobici, Steinbeck's editor. He, so he was selling shark's liver oil to everybody. Um, the Wave Shock Essay, a lovely little book that many of you may have seen, um, uh, published up in Sitka. Um, because that's where it was written when Ricketts was there with Joseph Campbell and um, the, uh, on a trip that he took uh, up there in 1932. So that was published with several essays written by um, other scientists and Nancy Ricketts. And he planned a handbook on the intertidal life of San Francisco Bay. That's what he and Steinbeck were going to do before they went to see of Cortez. Um, that handbook was never finished, never done. And there, was no, there wasn't an intertidal survey of San Francisco Bay done until 1998. So the fact that Ricketts and Steinbeck didn't do it, nobody did it. And so, um, you know, he was on the scene at an important time. And then depletion of the sardines in Monterey Bay. Of course, I love these sardine issues. This is the cover of one of them on the Monterey Peninsula Herald. And, you know, uh, Ricketts wrote quite a number of essays for this sardine issues in 1942, 1946, 1947, 1948. He wrote articles talking about the variety of reasons that the sardines were depleted in Monterey Bay. So the words that I like to think about um, when I think about Ricketts are these. His mind had no horizons. That I think that's an incredible phrase to say about someone else, um, that you have the mi this mind that embraces all. Uh, and ecology as a synonym, um, synonym, which is all. So Ricketts' mind is a kind of um, a, a compendium of ideas. So here's my transition between part one and part two. Very many conclusions Ed and I worked out together through endless discussion and reading and observation and experiment. We had a game which we playfully called speculative <laughs> metaphysics. It was a sport consisting of lopping off a piece of observed reality and letting it move through the speculative process like a tree growing tall and bushy. Um, now, this is very much like the way that 
the American Romantics described their process of thought. That it's not, it wasn't rational and logical, but Emerson and Thoreau um, talked about thoughts as branching. So they were organic, like something in nature, a tree, a bush. Um, Thoreau in um, Walden has a wonderful image of water coming down a hill and branching out like that looks like a tree and all of life is connected. The water, the tree, our minds, our, the veins in our bodies, etc. And so Steinbeck uses the same image. So what was the significance of this friendship between the two? Um, scientist and writer. These pictures, by the way, are on the web. They were taken by St Peter Stackpole um, in 1935 or 36. I interviewed Peter Stackpole and he didn't know where the negatives were. So a long time they were lost, but he was taking photographs for Life magazine. Um, and what he remembered about the whole thing when I talked to him was Steinbeck there was on the floor. All these are Steinbeck smoking. Um, so here are the intersecting ideas. Again, this is just a survey. This talk is a survey of the impact the two men had on one another, but it was significant. Um, shared ecological sensibilities. Um, Steinbeck from taking science courses here. Uh, by nature, Ste Steinbeck's mind was also sort of yeasty and outward looking and curious. I mean, Steinbeck was reading physics um, in 1930. Uh, before he met um, Ricketts, um, he, was, uh, a cur he had a lot of curiosity about science all of his life. Communal organisms, um, we know that that was Ricketts' interest. Just think about the Grapes of Wrath and the Jodes and how they live together and how they shift as a group and um, merge with other groups. So the whole idea of communities are important throughout Steinbeck's prose, obviously Ricketts' ideas. Non-teleological thinking. Um, the book that best illustrates that is the original title of Mice and Men, Something That Happens. Um, Non-teleological thinking, described chapter 14 and Sea of Cortez, is is thinking. Um, simply a looking closely at what is um, and paying attention and not looking at consequences or results or teleology means the end of things, but simply studying what, what is. Related to participation, which is also an important idea. Four levels of ecology, Ricketts defined in part of an essay. I just wrote a little book on the Grapes of Wrath with regard to what that means in terms of layers. But um, it's basically an, an increasingly complex awareness of what ecology means. Um, wave shock, uh, the essay he wrote in Sitka is related to Steinbeck's idea about survivability. He thought that those humans who were most admirable were those that were buffeted by experience the most, like the Jodes, and think of muscles on rocks. That's what Ricketts is talking about when he's talking about wave, wave shock. Um, so throughout Steinbeck's career, he's suspicious of when life gets too easy, when Americans are too soft, which is what he's writing about in the 60s. And he's still talking about this notion of survivability in the 60s, um, Steinbeck is. And then holistic sensibilities defined in Sea of Cortez, Canary Row, et cetera. So the number of intersecting ideas between this writer and this scientist are many, are interesting, and clearly they spent a lot of time discussing all of these notions. Um, so as I said, they appear in The Grapes of Wrath, and they appear most clearly in Sea of Cortez, which, as Ricketts says, was like a John Ed sit by the fire. I don't know why he called it that, because there was no fire place in the lab, unless I suppose you opened the stove. But um, you get the idea that it was like a fireside chat, like a Roosevelt's fireside chat. It's based on conversation. So they, they talked all the time. And to base a book on conversation is to have the book meander, because conversations meander. They're not logical. They're just sometimes people are frustrated with reading Sea of Cortez, because you know, where, do I, where do I start? Where do I stop? Um, but that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a conversation. Where he went to th on the trip, the new species beside the human. That's why my interest in biology and ecology becomes so sharpened. The bioecological pattern having as its conception base an immeasurable length and time sequence does not admit 
of the emphasis of such crises as human unemployment, except insofar as they virtually threaten the existence of the species. I mean, it's interesting because what Steinbeck does, almost what Rick, is the same thing Ricketts does. Ricketts has just finished Rick, Between Pacific Tides, which is a close look at the intertidal. Steinbeck has been looking at a social problem very closely. And they simply widen their perspective, literally, by going to the Gulf and saying, let's look at, you know, an, for Ricketts, another area, for Steinbeck, another um, discipline, and simply widen our perspective to include Steinbeck or to, to include um, Baja. The idea of the book loomed up more and more as the significant feature of the whole thing. We both became quite sure that it could be a very great thing, maybe a very great modern odyssey. I like that, that comment because a modern odyssey makes it seem like they, they're starting out on an epic. We're going on an epic voyage. This is important. It's not insignificant. I think you're going to Ulysses and uh, go on an adventure. And I also love the subtitle of Sea of Cortez because it also is kind of embraces a lot, just like their minds, like their, the quality of that friendship, which they sparked one another. A leisurely journal of travel and research. And if you take all those words, leisurely, we're going to take our time, just like the Grapes of Wrath and the turtle in the beginning of the Grapes of Wrath. Journal, a journal is a sort of a daily account. It's personal. Um, it is not meant to be formal. Uh, travel, uh, you know, travel accounts can be pretty boring, but travel and research is a combination of, you know, what we learned and what we did. We wanted to see everything our eyes could accommodate. Again, that expansiveness that was characteristic of each of them. Now, I love the introduction to Sea of Cortez, and when I, when I, whenever we teach, I t sometimes teach with my husband, Gilly, and I sometimes teach it at San Jose State, but I spend a lot of time on this wonderful, wonderful introduction where he talks about what's going to happen in the book. And he says, okay, you can take the Sierra and you can count the um, dorsal fins and then you've got some notion of what this fish is. But if, you, if he comes in over the rail, his colors pulsing and his tail beating the air, a whole new relational externality has come into being an entity which is more than the sum of the fish plus fishermen. Now, this is basically the thesis of the book, told, in, you know, expressed in a fish. But the, the, uh, the whole book looks at the particular and then goes to the general and embraces the whole. Um, it's just like the quality of the friendship between Steinbeck and Ricketts, always going from the tide pool to the stars, always having thought branched out. So that sentence says it all, but of course he says it again because that's what you have to do if you want people really to listen. Um, and this is a statement of what the book's all about too. We take a tiny colony of soft corals from a rock in a little water world. This is not coral, by the way, <laughs> just so for, um, And that isn't terribly important to the tide pool, but basically you look closely at something. And 50 miles away, the Japanese shrimp boats are dredging with overlapping scoops, bringing up tons of the species, so they may never come back. And with the species, destroying the ecolo ecological balance of the whole region. Still happening. That isn't very important in the world. And thousands of miles away, the great bombs are falling, and the stars are not moved thereby. This was taken on his trip to Kiev in 1947. None of it's important, or all of it is. I mean, that's a great statement of ecological significance, that the small things are equally important um, and as the large things. And what I just recently, I mean, obviously, whenever we always see new things, um, when they stop at Pomo Reef, and we were on a trip where we were about to stop at Pomo Reef, so I was reading this several times, um, where there is coral, it's a coral reef in the Gulf, and he taught, he, Steinbeck writes, clinging to the coral, growing on it, burrowing into it, was a teeming fauna. Every piece of the soft material broken off, skittered, and pulsed with life. Every piece of the soft material broken off, well, he just talked about breaking off coral as a you know, destructive act. And then he says, the water behind the reef was very war warm. We abandoned our boots, and putting on tennis shoes to protect our feet from various stingers, 
We dived again and again for perfect knobs of coral. I don't think this is accidental. I think he's implicating himself in that whole ecological picture, where, you know, at times we all do things that destroy the environment. We break off coral, we, you know, we have to drop a bomb, etc. But it's an awareness that we're all part of a whole, um, however flawed we are. So um, the we is Steinbeck, it's Ricketts, it's Carol, it's a collective we. In Sea of Cortez, he names all the crew, he, and kind of they have characters, he kind of builds their characters. But the we is collective, um, and I think he's saying even, you know, as we go here, as we're in charge, we make the same kind of mistakes that we fault others for. Um, at, throughout the trip, they're interested in distribution. Um, they say that they um, picked up mats and clusters of um, brittle stars. Uh, we've never found mats and clusters, but they're still there in twisting, squirming knots. But basically, they go around the Gulf, and they, they're looking at distribution of animals in the Gulf. So the book insistently goes to these catalogs of intertidal animals. And if you haven't been down there, or if you don't like reading catalogs of invertebrates, you think, where is this book going? But it has to go there, because it has to keep going to the particular, so the book can start over going to the, the web of life, um, to the universal. Um, so um, Whitman was Rickett's favorite poet from when he was in high school. So that's what Whitman does, too. I'm sh I don't know how many of you have read Leaves of Grass recently, but um, Leaves of Grass. Huh. Leaves of Grass also goes from I'm running unobserved power, so what? Um, also goes from these catalogs that you know, catalog American life, each leaf. Each blade of grass makes up the whole. And that's what Ricketts and Steinbeck are doing as well. Um, so what does all this mean? It means that this whole book um, is going to the place their friendship went insistently. That a man looking at reality brings his own limitations to the world. If he has strength and energy of mind, the tide pool stretches both ways, digs back to the electron and leaps space into the universe and fights out of the moment into non-conceptual time, then ecology has a synonym, which is all. So all is what the book is constantly reaching for, and it does it again and again. This is from um, Cannery Row. This is from um, chapter four of um, Sea of Cortez, what he talks about men re really need sea monsters in their personal oceans. It insistently goes to the place of mystery, to the unknown, to the things that we know, the catalog of, of invertebrates, to the things that we can't quite fathom, or um, easily, certainly. Cabo San, San Lucas, this, trying to plug in my computer while I talk, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, Cabo San Lucas is the lo rocks that are almost literary. Um, and perhaps we take some of our deep feelings of termination from these things, and they make our symbols. I mean, to call rocks almost liter literary is an incredible description of, of um, the abstract and the place they keep pushing to in Sea of Cortez. Sometimes one has a feeling of fullness, of warm wholeness, wherein every sight and object and odor and experience seems to key into a gigantic whole. That day, even the mangrove was part of it. Perhaps among primitive peoples, the human sacrifice has the same effect of creating wholeness of sense and emotion, the good and the bad, the beautiful and the ugly. Hmm. Well, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, OK. So uh, that's where Steinbeck is going with this whole notion of layers here in his books. That last layer is that sense of um, embracing the whole. And that's, that's this fourth layer, or the fifth layer. So when he's writing his books in layers, he's talking about the surface, the physical, to often the metaphysical, or the abstract. Um, and it's what Joseph Campbell understood about Sea of Cortez when he read it. Look at, he read it in the 
three weeks. Um, it came out on December 5th, I believe, and he responded to Ed by the 25th and says this same thing. Great societies are themselves units of sublime, all-inclusive organism which breathes and go on, goes on in dreamlike half-consciousness of its own life. So that's where Sea of Cortez is going. I want to conclude with this. Um, so Steinbeck wrote the book several months after he came back from Sea of Cortez. And he wrote at the very beginning that the design of a book is the pattern of reality controlled and shaped by the mind of the writer. He was the writer. He was the one who took the material. He took Ricketts notes. Um, Ricketts notes are pretty flimsy. Except for about drinking in Guaymas, but generally they're, you know, and Steinbeck really embroiders and builds on the sort of platform that Ricketts creates. Ricketts notes, for instance, that the incident of the light over the grave of the guy who died on Monday in Cabo San Lucas, and Steinbeck writes, in the brush beside the track, there was a little heap of light, and as we came closer to it, we saw a rough wooden cross lighted indirectly. The cross arm was bound to the staff with a thong, and the whole cross seemed to glow alone in the darkness. When we came close, we saw that a kerosene can stood on the ground, and that in it was a candle which threw its feeble light upward on the cross. And that's a lovely description, but you know, it's, he has three sentences about light and about that shifting light. And that's what Steinbeck did in Sea of Cortez. That's what he created. And that's really what, St what Ricketts admired about Steinbeck. He admired his discipline, and he admired his ability to write. Um, and those things he constantly praised. So this book, which was a collaboration, I think was a collaboration that sort of elevated <laughs> Ricketts as well. Um, to a kind of legendary status because he becomes, you know, part of this whole that the two created. That Steinbeck really created a narrative for Ricketts. Um, and there's basically 20 years of Ricketts in Steinbeck's prose. Um, and that statement, no one who knew him well will deny the force and influence of Ed Ricketts. Everyone near him was influenced by him deeply and permanently. But without Steinbeck's narratives, would we know anything about Ricketts? I know that's kind of a heretical statement to make after the end of a Ricketts seminar. But I was with a bunch of scientists on a trip in January, and I thought all of them need novelists by their side. Because if you have somebody telling your story, um, you become a part of a sort of a legendary um, world. And so if you think about all the things that Steinbeck wrote about his friend Ricketts, starting with The Snake, a short story in 1935, and ending with Pipe Dream in 1955, he kept rewriting Ricketts. Um, Ricketts ached him like a missing arm after he, was, um, after he died. And you can even say that about Ed Ricketts, that wonderful little essay that he wrote for Log from the Sea of Cortez, when he took Ricketts' name off the book, which is probably not his finest moment. But probably the essay did more for Ricketts' reputation than his name on the book. You could argue that. Um, I'm not saying any of you would, but you could argue that. Um, so that, you know, Ricketts exists in this, what Steinbeck made of him, the prose that he created. Um, and I think that's really important to um, who, what, how we know who he is. Um, you know, Sea of Cortez Stein was Steinbeck's favorite book, he told his wife. Um, it was a book that kept, he kept coming back to in his own mind. Um, and he said, when it, it seems to grow in people, such a book can't be sold. It has to creep by itself, which is the way he starts Cannery Row, too, that, you know, animals just creep in. I'm going to skip this letter, but here he says we were together. And I want to end with John's boat. Um, because in a way, the, the stature of this boat and what's happened since it's been sold and the New York Times covering it and the symposium and the interest in you know, creating something for children is <coughs> testimony to how much this means and how it's kind of almost a, 
like a piece of the true cross to have a you know a nail or a piece of the boat or whatever um, that it's really just taken on this stature that amazes me but I think it's it's testimony to what that friendship means um, and largely from the writing of Steinbeck a boat more than any other tool man uses is a little represent representation of an archetype I love that quote and I'm going to end there because in some ways um, their friendship was also a kind of archetype and I think they both needed one another but um, it was very much a symbi symbiotic relationship but out of it came something incredible a kind of archetype so thank you mm -hmm.